today I'm going to um, speak about uh, the C extension and the work uh, I did to benchmark um, to benchmark and the, the process that I did to benchmark it. Um, so what's the T? What the T is? Um, I, uh, so Risk Five is a open ISA, like Jeremy just said, uh, that was designed at University of Berkeley, uh, California, Berkeley. Um, it's designed to target a wide range of applications, from from embedded all the way to high performance computing. It has very nice two features that allow us to that allow it to actually target this wide range of applications. Uh, the first one is uh, variable length. The, the instruction, uh, the ISA itself is a variable length. That means instructions can be um, like a different of a different length is any any length multiple multiples of 16 bits. And the ISA has some vaccine encoding space that third parties can use to design their own extensions to enhance its performance in um in like uh, ways that they wish for their own application uh when trying to compare the normal risk five um uh, code size density and uh, and code size performance against um other commercial um isas it's considerably we found that it's considerably worse like 20 25 percent even with a compressed um compressed extension that it provides which is for the 16 bit which is which which is um uh, so there is a compressed uh, extension that provides a set of 16 bit um instructions that should help with the code size but even with that the um the, the code uh, the application code size are often much larger than arm like that than like uh, alternative commercial uh, processors like arm um so to try um to understand why this is we need to have a couple of benchmarks uh like a, a test suit to actually understand like check all the possible um reasons why this is and try to figure out uh, what can we do to improve it and this this there is a lot to consider and a lot of things that can change the performance like it can have a significant change in the performance. So the type of the workload, if it was like a very simple IoT application with a couple of sensors and Arcos, it would likely have very different behavior and very different code size to be analyzed, rather than like comparing to a, a machine learning algorithm, say for example, or a high performance thing. And the language that the program itself is written in would also have a, a significant like influence on the um, on the the um, code size, so it's when, when we're trying also to understand the, the, the why the code size is bad, we need to look at different um, test sets from different uh, like languages, and we also need to consider the compiler that the compilers that were used to compile these test suite with the the, the normal known ones are GCC and Clang, but there are some other commercial alternatives that also compile for RISC V. And also, uh, we need to consider the ABI that was used to compile the program. There is the universal ABI that's known and used everywhere and frozen. There is the embedded ABI, and that's still not frozen um, and uh, will likely get frozen sometime soon. And we also need to consider 32-bit instructions and 64-bit instructions, uh, the ISA for 64 and 32-bit. All of this we need to consider and figure out all different possible cases for uh, like like we need to make sure that we don't overlook uh, any we just focus on something like embedded or uh, programs that are compiled with gcc and not take care of what clang does so it might have a different behavior that we might over optimize for gcc and propose something that would work with gcc say an embedded and a c program but we might not actually optimize for all possible cases so when trying to find wow what's what what can we do? It's nice to have, it's nice to be able to look at the problem from all the sites, from all these sites. And also when we're trying to um, like figure out things that we need to, like when we are trying to propose instructions that we can use to um, help with the code size, we need to look at possible side effects. Like we can propose an instruction that would help the code size significantly, but it might have very bad performance penalty that make it like not not usable so we also need to look at that and also power consumption and implementation complexity so we might 
and like a proposal instruction that would reduce the code size significantly as well. But it, if if the if the hardware um, required to actually implement this instruction is very expensive, that it costs more than the actual size difference in flash and RAM and ROM, then it would be not worth it to actually implement that instruction. So we also need to look at possible side effects. Also, for, for a given compiler, the compilers will have like uh, flags that would affect the compilation settings. Like the known very obvious one is the optimization level. So O1, O2, O0, likewise, OS, which is we use for code size. And there are some other things would affect, there are a lot of flags that would affect the compiler behavior. The common ones for code size are and save restore, which used to save and restore saved registers to stack. And FF function uh, sections, data sections, and these sections are used to put the functions and data sections, like into separate sections that can be, that the compiler uh, and linker can easily remove. Um, uh, so, um, so to actually figure out what what is like to figure out all of these variables and see what 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 is important and what is not, uh, I wrote a simple script uh, that a simple Python script that part like that you we give an L file input L file executable file, and what it does is that it uses Python process open it just call obsdom. And it requests from Objdom the static symbol table, dynamic symbol table, and the disassembly. And it saves the disassembly, that script, and then it stops. It shows here that it's a cycle because it's it's nice to show it as a cycle, but it actually stops. And then you can um, then the script would take on like the arg uh, in the arguments from the command line as actions to actually what it should do. And if uh, some of these actions require it to um, construct something that I call instruction instructions record, um, and some of them don't. So if if the if the action require it to construct an instruction record, then we construct an instruction record, and I perform very limited um, uh, control flow graph recovery. It's very very limited. I I'll speak about that shortly, and then uh, sometimes we might want to opt like check how. Uh, different things affect uh, the code size multiple how how like sometimes some we we might propose optimizations that might have overlap so some we might propose an instruction that might cause other instructions to be less effective so we need to be able to actually execute these instructions in a sequential manner one after another so there, there is a loop here uh, that actually check all the actions on the command line and execute them sequentially and then we report the results of the saving. So we actually go to the back to, so this um, optimization would um, find the optimization that we want to, find the instructions that we want to optimize in the instruction record. And then it will replace these instructions. It will check that they actually like uh, match the criteria that we are trying to replace for. And then it will replace them in the instruction record. And then after that, when we uh, finally um, go um, to exit, if there, uh, if a CSV file is specified in the command line, then it will export all the results to CSV file. Otherwise, it will just output the results to um, the command line. Um, it might have been a better idea to actually use binary file descriptor and C types from Python to actually parse the symbol table instead of calling obsdom. But it was uh, something that initially started as very very small, so I thought I'll just call obsdom and it just like ex expanded. Um, there are some other open source tools that does uh, CFG recovery much, much better than what I do. But most of them have, uh, I didn't actually look at them before, but when I was uh, researching like what would other people do in, in this field, I saw that there are like, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Radare, that's used to, uh, that, that can do something like this, but it doesn't have full uh, RISC-V support. Um, so most of so when we're trying to optimize um, the risk five instruction set, what uh, there are there are two types of instruction proposal that we can propose to actually improve the code size. Um, like I said earlier, there are it's there is already um, a compressed instruction set. So if um, some some instructions don't have a compressed form, so they don't have a 16-bit instruction, and we have some empty um, encoding space in the 16-bit. Uh, in the 16-bit encoding space. So we can actually um, uh, convert some of the long instructions and create a new 
compressed um, instructions, uh, or we can find a common instruction sequences um, and try to fuse them into a single instruction. Now, all of this is fine, but how do we actually find out what instructions and what things we should um, like try to optimize for? It's we can try to do that like using static analysis manually by just going over an ELF file with Objdom and trying to like figure out common instruction sequences. Or what we can do is try to um, like let the script to try to track how destination registers are get used throughout uh, um, like next instructions. So it will find. So for example, I want to try to figure out optimization for um, load word, what I can do is that I can either try to figure out how the source for this instruction was created. So, and then try to, um, like for example, I can know that uh, load over immediate is then uh, is used before load word. And if I know that there is significant portion of the program that contains instructions like this, I can propose, for example, to fuse them and try to fit a longer immediate range in uh, a new instruction, which is one of the instructions we proposed, uh, we will show later. Uh, or um, I can track the destination register for something, for, for a normal instruction. So I can have an ad and I would check for the destination register of this ad, how it got used over the next couple of instructions before it gets overwritten by something else. So the script can do both of these to try to assess finding couple of optimization that can help us figure out what can we what can we optimize. Um, this is all nice, uh, but how do we uh, when we there is a couple of issues that I face when trying to actually implement this. Um, they are very simple when I is uh, they're very simple, but I think they are worth mentioning. Um, so when we are trying to traverse a program, we might, as long as we don't reach any conditional or unconditional branches, it's fine. We can just traverse and check for destination register sources and just track normally. But if we find any unconditional or conditional branches or even a branch target, we don't know what the register, register file content would be. So the, the, the content might get changed throughout. So our tracking for destinations and sources might get might be wrong. So we need to take care of that. Um, the, the trying to figure out um, for, for unconditional uh, for unconditional calls, we can do a simple trick since we know which register which registers will be saved from the caller and pulley, we can um, if if we know that the registers if we know that the compiler won't guarantee that the um, registers that we are tracking won't be saved wh when we exit the, the function, then we don't we, we can assume uh, safely that we um, can say that this sequence is valid and there isn't anything that this intermediate value that we calculated, we, we found, would nothing else would depend on it after the branches. If, if it is unconditional branch after and the register is one of the registers that we can be sure from the ABI that it won't, uh, that the compiler won't guarantee to be still after. If it's unconditional branches, we cannot do much. It's more difficult Then we need to, in theory, then we need to check for both cases and try to figure out that. But I actually don't do that. I only, I only check for conditional branches. If I see any unconditional branches, uh, any conditional branches, I just clear my uh, buffer of tracking instructions and then uh, just carry on to try to find the next sequence. Um, initially, when I implemented this, I my instruction record, the main key I used uh, was the function name, which is a bad idea because function names can be not unique if it was if we are like using uh, static functions. I didn't realize this until I saw that I'm writing multiple um, functions, multiple function content in the same functions for the instruction record. So I had to uh, come up with a unique name. Um, so, like I said earlier in the the, the previous the, the first slide, that for for when we're trying to actually uh, look at the best like, like try to find optimization, we need to uh, look at a wide benchmark um, benchmark sets to figure out to make sure that instructions that we propose for a uh, for a for a program would apply or at least 
would apply and have some effect on other programs. And it's just not very local optimization that only apply to a single program and does not apply elsewhere. So in the, um, like, at the moment for uh, ZCE, um, we have um, a lot more, we have a lot of uh, sets for RV32 and we have also for RV64. But we did a lot of the analysis on RV32 because the main focus of ZCE extension is for embedded, for small embedded cores that really uh, the, the code size for them is critical. Um, so, so Zephyr and Huawei IoT code, they are a small Arcos. Um, the, the Huawei IoT one is used for IoT application. Test float is the test for floating point operations. There is mBench and CoreMark. Uh, Jeremy uh, is like responsible for mBench, uh, for development of mBench. And there is um, the Opus and L3C that they are audio codec. Uh, for RV64, um, uh, we downloaded the um, uh, compiled Debian distribution for RV64, and I just get the highest 30, the biggest 30 uh, ELF files and use them as my test set. And we were trying to find something that actually is written mostly in C++. So V8 JavaScript engine was a one example of an application that was written in C++. So we this is this is our um, test set. It's we we tried to, and all of these applications we actually compiled them in GCC and also LLVM to make sure that we are not missing one side. We to make sure that we are not only optimizing for GCC and something else. And LLVM does something that make uh, that render our optimization completely useless. We really don't want to do that. We want to make sure that all the optimizations or instructions that we propose will apply to most of our set, our test set here. Um, so uh, the final, the final, the, well, the, um, the ZCE extension, um, th there is a mailing list and you can follow like the development of the, of each of these instructions there and how they are proposed and why why they are, what, how, how they are. Um, but uh, this is like a screenshot of the current uh, subsets of the ZCE extension. It has uh, A, A subset and B subset. Um, because, uh, because ZCE is targeted toward um, like small embedded devices, we would assume that these devices don't have double floating point um, arithmetic. So uh, we um, we use some of the um, D extension encoding space to um, um, implement some new instructions, um, uh, specifically load and store. Um, if somebody would want um, to use um, double floating point instructions, double floating point instructions along with uh, ZCE, that they can use some uh, diff a different um, extension that's called ZFNX, which which um, is a, a different extension that we are currently discussing that actually uh, removes the floating point registers from um, the risk five and try to use the normal register file as for also as for floating points. So that can be used along with the B extension, but it cannot be used just for normal double floating point instruction. Uh, it's actually uh, ZFNX has also um, a derivative that's called ZDNX, so that's what's what's applicable here. Um, the A extension, we'd expect everybody would use that to actually um, like improve the file, uh, improve the size, and we try to put the most uh, uh, important instructions there, so uh, the B extension don't miss out on the common and important instructions. Uh, so, like I said earlier. Uh, we have two, two different ABIs, so we want to make sure that if we have instructions that are that depend on an ABI, we need to have an alternative that would have uh, that would apply to a different ABI. Uh, one example of this is the push pop instructions, which we'll discuss later. Um, it picks the ABI, like it, get, it, it, it. There are some uh, when when we do the analysis, uh, we would want to have a lot of we, um, I'll discuss push bob later, but there is two two versions for it that are one for the normal ABI, universal ABI, or one for the embedded, for one for UB ABI, one for the EABI. Um, I'll discuss most of these instructions later, but th these uh, this slide is just so that the subsets. Um, this subset I would get automatically inferred or implied by the existence of the M extension. 
Uh, and this subset will likely to be included in the RV uh, in the next um, uh, not, uh, in one of the next frozen sets. Um, I cannot call what is it called uh, RV thirty two A. I think for obligation. I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So uh, the instructions I showed previously. One of them is called table jar. What this instruction does is that it so um so um when we're trying to analyze L files, we often say that if the program would like to jump to a location far from where it is, the immediate uh, field would would be uh, would be a restriction. So what the compiler would do is that it would have two instruction multiple instructions to actually construct the address that it would want to jump to. Um, and this would cost a lot of code size, especially if we have, um, like, I don't know, flash, um, like, uh, ROM and the different, different locations in the program that are in the core that are far from each other. And we're trying to jump, uh, to subroutines in the different section that would require a long address, or even if we have just normal long address. Uh, so that would result in a lot of code sequences to generate the addresses that are used to jump to these subroutines and come back. Um, so what do we propose? We propose the um, um, uh, instruction that would have um, a table. And um, this instruction, we just give it a, the, a number. Of, so this instruction is configured by CSR, CSRs, which are like special registers to configure things in RISC-V. And um, uh, the, the, one of the CSR would tell um, where, the, uh, where this table location is. And then we have an instruction to jump to X location in that table. So you have um, like um, X number of entries. We have 255 at the moment, but let's say we have X number of entries. Then we can we can just jump to any location in this table. We're just using a compressed instruction. Um, uh, the, the, the multiple modes for this table gel were like discussed, but um, the one we are using um, is called table mode, which uses the lower two bits to uh, decide which um, register it should link to. Um, okay, um, so um, this is um, a common sequence that we can see when trying to analyze um, a RISC V um, uh, L file uh, program. Um, so we can see that it uses AUIPC and JALR as a sequence and like 64 bit sequence to actually just jump to uh, a routine. This routine, I know that it's um, msave. Uh, so it's jumping to msave, which I um, mentioned earlier that this msave would just um, save um, uh, sequence, save a couple of saved registers in a sequence. That's also a saving um, like, like method. So uh, instead of these two 64-bit instructions, we can replace them with a single 16-bit instruction that would just tell, it's called table jar, and it would just jump to X entry in the, uh, in the table that we, we discussed. Um, and likewise for this and this. So it, it, this 32-bit instruction can, um, configure, can be converted to, 30, uh, to 16, and likewise for uh, this 32-bit. Um, so to actually figure out what what is the um, uh, the code savings from a table jar? We can just get all the function calls, and then we can go through all these function calls and change the weights of them. Because, like I said earlier, um, that some of some instructions, if they don't, if they are just jar, they would save only sixteen bits. But if they are if they have AUIPC and um, jump register or JALR, it would save um, uh, 64, um, 32 bit instruction, here, 32 bit instruction here, and then 16 half of this. Um, so that's 48 bit. Um, so uh, we need to make sure that we give priority to the ones that saves more. So I change the weight for them, and then um, I actually eliminate the one that won't gain for anything from the substitution. And then I change the way to give preference to the ones that would save more. And then we get the most common X entries. And then, like I said earlier, we have instruction records. So I actually replace them in the instruction records that we generated earlier. And then we calculate the new, the new um, instruction record size. And that would tell us how much 
from the change in the instruction record how much was changed, how much code saving we did. Uh, I, I, I always mentioned uh, X um, because we don't know how many entries we, we need to actually uh, get the most code savings with the least amount of encoding space. So what we can do is that we can just, um, after we implemented all this logic to try to, for table job, we can just run it in a for loop just from uh, zero to unlimited and evaluate for all and try to figure out the sweet spot where the least encoding space is used for the most amount of significant saving, uh, which is, we find that it's 255 to um, 256 table uh, size. Um, a different instruction um, uh, that um, I would like to mention, I'm trying, a different instruction that I would like to mention is uh, push and pub and pub break. These instructions are similar to msave restore, which I mentioned earlier, which just save a couple of saved registers and retrieve them at the end. Um, uh, but instead of actually having, um, um, the problem with msave restores is that sometimes they are too far and the, 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 um, the, and the instruction, uh, unlike the, um, the program would need to jump to them. And, uh, and also jump back. And that would cause a couple of jumps for each time uh, this is um, executed. And it might need to construct a long address to jump to them if they were far. So there is a different um, instruction that we propose that's push, pub, and pop break. Um, the push would just push um, an, a, a number of saved registers um, into a stack. And then uh, the pub would retrieve them from the stack. These are commonly executed at the app log and prelog of a function um, because it needs to save the saved registers and restore them. Uh, but this can also be used, uh, this function. If we, instead of the stack pointer, we just point to somewhere, um, we can use it to actually interface with buses. Like we can push data to our bus by just changing Instead of the stack pointer, we put the stack pointer into a different location. We change the stack pointer, and we use and we push data directly to our bus or something like this. If it's uh, memory mapped, um, so yeah, we can do a single instruction that performs all of that. And this instruction also um, uh, um, have embedded moves that moves um, these moves from A to S would be also embedded um, in the instructions. And we from our analysis script, we determine that. Uh, these moves would depend obviously on the number of saved registers. So we try to find the best um, relation between these. Uh, I would automate this, uh, these instructions would automatically adjust the stack pointer for the number of uh, pushed, pushed uh, registers. Um, the, last, the last optimization I would like to mention from the sets I shown, there is a lot of in different instructions, but I, I will mention a couple of them and just show the results right to finish. Um, so, um, uh, so when when we have um, an array of structures, um, what uh, like this very simple um, C code? What this the compiler? What would what would it do? Is that it would uh, have this sequence and then um, this? So what it would do is that it would load an immediate to get the element size of the, and then it would come uh, multiply this element size by the index to get the actual location. And then it would add it to the um, base address. So these three instructions would need to be executed every time we need to get an element from this array. This is, we, we often see that in, um, in our IoT code and some other codes. So it would be nice to actually implement an instruction that would just perform all of these instructions or add the, uh, like in a single instruction. And that's what Malai add does is just uh, load an immediate and it will multiply that immediate by a different register and it would add the result to a different to a third register. When we're trying to analyze this and find uh, such instances, we need to make sure that the intermediate results are not being used. Um, likewise, there is malai and add I add, which uh, do exactly the same as they refer to. So it, it just load an immediate and it multiplies it, um, multiply it with a register and add I add does add i and then it adds a different register to that a, a register to that um so um like we did for table uh jal and we were trying to find to figure out the best number of entries for table jal 
we did the same thing for all of the, we did that for all of the instructions, but I wanted to show you another figure for this, which is the Malay Emilius. We can, uh, from the encoding space, we can have up to 12 bits, but if we look, if we try to figure out the best, best use for our encoding bits, the, the encoding bits are like very, very valuable in the ISA. So if you reserve a couple of more, if you reserve encoding bits that we don't, use we they are not useful then other extensions that cannot cannot use them and we are wasting very very valuable encoding space that we are not getting um uh, like uh, any ga significant gains from so it would be very very good to actually figure out what's the most saving we get from uh, instructions so for that the malai the load immediate we need to figure out what's the best use for that so here we can see that at 10 bits in most of our subset, in our mo most of our um, test suit, we'd see around 10 bits. Uh, the, the gains would be saturated. I wouldn't get much from increasing one or two more bits, which are very, very valuable. So I think it makes sense to actually cap that to 10 bits instead of the maximum 12 for that's available in our encoding space. Um, um, these are, um, like I said earlier, it's uh, like the 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 the, um, the, um, the results. Generally, um, risk five when we were trying to compare it with other alternative commercial cores, it was around 20, 25 percent worse. Um, just these two instructions combined would would often result in um, yeah, more than 10 percent saving. Uh, this average is a little bit um, not accurate because a, a significant amount of this subset that I'm showing here from our complete test set is mbench. Um, the issue with mbench is that table jal, um, the, 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 the mbench sets, are, they are very, very small. So table jal doesn't do a great job of optimizing them. But for example, if we look at our IoT code, a significant like 7 or 10%, 9% of the code size is, is being uh, like saved, which is very, very significant amount. If we, if we think about uh, the flash save, the RAM save, also, the performance might get affected because of the cache and all of that. Um, uh, and the, the, these instructions, they, they save much less. So like I said, much less than these, but there are still very significant gains. Um, the issue, uh, so sometimes, um, uh, so I will just go to a final slide to show you a screenshot of the um, complete set results. I know that it's not showing properly here, but I, um, these will be um, released on GitHub, so you can actually look at each instructions and what what's what the what it's saving is. Uh, I'm not sure if we have more time. I can go through all the instruction set and figure out, uh, like, show you how quickly and show you what what sequences we actually try to figure out to find. But if we don't, then the, uh, I'm done. Ibrahim, uh, thank you yeah. very much. I think that's a good point to stop. If we yeah. end up with other talks taking less time and more time at the end, then we can come back to these. And of course, this is great stuff. We can always invite you back to a future meeting. So, Excellent. Um, Thank you very much. Um, while uh, Nidal sets himself up, are there any immediate questions? I noticed a bit of conversation going on in the public chat. Please do use it uh, for that. Um, 